follow on me We're marching out into the night Follow on me We're standing up against the giant Follow on me We might be walking in the fire But if it's where we're meant to be Then on me I do show that it is 1513 and for those of you that have uh, been on our uh, previous uh, calls, you know that th the significance of that was John 15, 13. And uh, that says, greater love has no one than this than them to lay down their life for their friends. And that's what Mark did. Uh, he willingly gave his life to save his teammates and for the freedoms that we enjoy each and every day. And so that's the significance of that time. And uh, this is our gift back to you. Mark talks about doing more random acts of kindness, how we could change our world. And he said, when's the last time you paid for a stranger's cup of coffee or a meal or a tank of gas? And so this is our random act of kindness that we can give back to you in the midst of coronavirus. There's you know, so many trials, so many tragedies, so many life changes, so much transition that's going on in people's lives. And I know that so many people are struggling, you know, many of you maybe have lost your, your job or if you're in the military, you've got to stop loss and you can't get out and can't transition or um, can't get back to your family. Some of you have lost loved ones. And so this is a tough time. So we've been blessed to have um, so many amazing guests that have donated their time and joined us. And Jenna Lee, we just want to welcome you to here today. Um, the special connection there is you are the spouse of Leif Babin. So if you were here for podcast number one, this is his lovely wife, Jenna. And um, Leif was with Mark when he died and, and they may not be blood family, even though she has the had the same last name. <laughs> we are definitely family. And I think sometimes you're closer in those circumstances than you are even to, to your own family. So we're excited to have you here today. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me. It's good. Now I can, I can really share what life is really like. Oh, <laughs> my and we'll have, yeah. we'll, have it, we'll have it on film. <laughs> it's just because I'm donating my time, Debbie. That's, that's, that's right. what I get to do. You know, that's right. But, but Paybacks, to. right? Mark might have a hand in that too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Here we go. Well, <laughs> well, we are excited to have you today. And, you know, I think even just like that, the, even the laughter of the moment, you know, that's one of the things in the midst of all of this craziness, of all of the change, um, even for those of you who maybe have lost a loved one in the midst of this, laughter is good medicine for the soul. And we have to, even in the midst of crisis, we have to be able to laugh from time to time. And um, so thank you for bringing a little laughter in into this um podcast, webinar, whatever it is that we're, we're calling it. A motivational series, I guess that's, that's a better title. But <laughs> I would just like to share with people who don't know you as well as I do a little bit of your bio. I'm sure many uh, of our listeners probably recognize you from when you were on Fox News National. But Jenna Lee is the CEO and founder of Smart Her News, a nonpartisan multimedia digital news service. A graduate of Columbia University School of Journalism, she reported on some of the biggest domestic and international news stories of the last 15 years as a writer, producer, and broadcast journalist. As a national news anchor at the Fox News Channel, Jenna co-hosted a daily two-hour live news program covering breaking news and conducted interviews with a wide range of guests, including presidential candidates, lawmakers, cabinet members, business leaders, military veterans, star athletes, and unsung heroes. She is most inspired by her work outside of the studio that combined American history and adventure. Jenna also co-anchored the first ever broadcast for the Fox Business News Network, where she covered the historic financial crisis of 2008. Jenna began her, began her career as a freelance journalist reporting for district newspapers in her hometown of San Francisco, California. She's married to Leif Babin, a former Navy SEAL officer, New York Times bestselling author and co-founder of Echelon Front, a premier leadership consulting firm. They live in Texas and are blessed with three wildly spirited children. Yes. So welcome, welcome. <laughs> it's exciting to have you here. I love how you describe your children, but um, amazing wow. kiddos. And one of the, one of the real honors um, for our family was when you were pregnant with your firstborn. And I remember uh, Leif was texting me, okay, we're going to the hospital. Okay, she's so many centimeters. Right? Oh play, by, 
play by play the where you're details. Yes. yes. Well, hey, and you know, I, I didn't want to tell him that, you know, some of those early ones, it's going to be a little while. She's yeah. still got a ways to go but <laughs> in the process. And then, um, it got later into the night, you know, and I'm like, Oh, I really want to stay awake for this. And I remember getting, uh, the text that, your little boy was born and Leif said, with your permission, we would like to name him after Mark. And I'll yeah. tell you what, what, what an honor that was. And, um, you know, as I've watched, uh, the family name is, um, Brian, his dad's name is Brian. Leif is actually Brian Leif. And, um, your little boy is Brian Mark named after Mark. His nickname is Trace. And, um, because, Uncle Mark could lay down lots of trace fire. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, I watched him grow. And that little boy, you guys have done an amazing job of teaching him who Mark is, that he's named after, who that namesake. And um, I love the, the last uh, package that you sent was one of the pictures that he had drawn of Mark on the mission. And I have it here in the hero's room taped on the door and just, um, I, it's, it's been awesome to watch your kiddos grow. Love them to pieces. I, I know they test you at times, but. Uh, yes, it's why I put in the headphones. Cause I was like, ah, I don't think the Bluetooth is gonna cut it. I was like, I need to focus. I can hear them running around in the background. No telling <laughs> when they're gonna come in. Uh, but yes, Trace is, Trace is so inquisitive. And I think our, our, uh, our friends here might, I mean, it's, when you're not part of a military family, you probably wouldn't understand this. I would not have understood this before because I had no real connection. My, my grandfather was a war correspondent in the, with the Associated Press during World War II. Um, and I have a lot of his papers, but as far as you know, a real connection through a relative sending someone into war, it's not mm -hmm. something that my family had experienced. But it's so interesting. I mean, there's been challenges with that, Debbie, of trying to like, how do you answer the questions that he's asking about Mark um, and what's appropriate for his age? And sometimes I feel like maybe we shared too much too soon. Um, but then he also, as you know, Debbie, will then tell you, you, what happened to Mark. <laughs> yeah. and, and we can all kind of laugh about it, even though it's like, it, it's, it's, it's so sad, but it's yeah. just a little, a little mind processing it. Yeah. This is what Mark did and Mark died. Did you know that Mark died? And we're all like, yes, we do. <laughs> we, we, you know, and he tells you, Debbie, like, did you yes. know about Mark? And you're Mark, like, but, but, yes, we but Mark died. But Mark yes, died. but Mark died. And you're yeah. like, yes. But do we have to say it all the time? You know, <laughs> <and> you're like, <laughs> you know, he's three, four, five. Now he's, 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 you know, he's living out this story. And, and you kind of have to laugh because they're so young and they don't really know that what they're saying is, is sad. And at the same time, you kind of appreciate the fact that yes. they're like, oh, and he died. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But it's yeah. significant to him. And you can yes. tell by being around yes. him how special that is and how important that is, you know. And then he does, you know, for how a child could understand, he does understand, but Mark yes. died, you know, it's oh, you know, but yeah, and he and he wants to tell you because he yeah. feels really it's like it's very powerful for him yes. to be able to share. I had to say that was one of the things moving to Texas that I wasn't prepared for. I um, you know, obviously we were in New York, we moved to Texas and, uh, the way that guns are talked about, carried, et cetera, all are different <laughs> here. And, Very different than New York. <laughs> you know, I didn't realize, and it's actually something it's, I have to be more forward leaning about it because it's happened now repeatedly. He went to a little preschool, you know, two days a week and he'll talk about guns and he'll talk about Mark. And one of his teachers was not prepared for that. Like she did not, she didn't understand. And even when I tried to explain to her, oh, my husband's a veteran and this is my three-year-old rattling off kind of what he's organizing his brain. I was expecting a lot more empathy for that and it didn't come, but it also caught her off guard. So I think I need to be a little bit better about that, giving people a heads up because it does come up in ways mm -hmm. that you just were like, I didn't know they'd be talking about that over Legos, but they are. And, you know, yeah. and here's why, you know? Yeah. So it's been interesting um, as a parent to try to navigate that. And I didn't really anticipate that. Yeah. So, uh, you know? Yeah. And you've got three kids and how, what are their ages? So Trace is going to be six in September. Liberty just turned four. So they're 18 months apart. And then I have little uh, True, Truett, 
um, and he is uh, named for Ryan Job, one of the other um, Leif's other teammates who passed away, and he is he just turned nine months. So yeah, that's crazy that day. he's nine months old already. <laughs> Yay, he's napping. Well, that's awesome. He's napping. I have to wake him up, but he'll be fine. That's good. He's napping right now. Right. Good. <laughs> so, Jenna, share with us a little bit. Um, I know that you were engaged to Leif and did a deployment. And of course, we always joke in the SEAL community, have, have, has the girlfriend done a deployment with you right. yet? Because that's the real test. So, so yeah. what, what was that like to, you know, as a fiance to have him deployed? What things did you struggle with back at home in the midst of that? Well, I mean, for me, it was totally foreign. I didn't know anything about deployment. And we have to remember the time and place is so easy to get removed now. And I'm sure for many of us, it's not, it doesn't seem that long ago. But at the time when he deployed, you know, Iraq was still a very, um, you know, dangerous place, clearly. And I was anchoring very early in the morning. So I go into work at, let's say, you know, two o'clock in the morning, I'd be on the air at 5 a.m. And what was interesting about that, it's about 5 a.m., 6 a.m., 7 a.m., right around that time is when there would be updates coming from the Middle East about what happened mm -hmm. that previous day, right? Because it's, it was middle of the day there, late afternoon there. So if something happened in the morning overnight, you'd start hearing about it then. And so I would be, because I, because I was doing business news at the time, reporting out earnings reports or doing breaking news, and I would see, you know, uh, a bomb blast here, you know, uh, casualties here. This is, you know, and, and we weren't covering that. I mean, it, even at the time, it, the violence was there, but it wasn't necessarily leading the news, and it wasn't leading the news on the business network. And so um, that was very difficult because I knew that, you know, someone that I loved was there. And I would see the news before anyone else because that's when the wires would break. Yeah. The press release would come out from the Department of Defense. And then you, I think there's this feeling because of the movies that, oh, we just have access to people all the time. And so I would see the headlines and then have to wait. And I knew roughly where he was. Um, but you know, you don't know. You, you don't know exactly what's going on. And so I'd have to wait and you wait for the call or the email or something just to make sure that they're okay. And as many people know, you, you may miss a call and then you're like, like, it's not like you can call them back. And if you do get to talk to them, they can't really tell you that much about what's going on. So it's a really one-sided conversation with the delay, you know? So it's like, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was a really challenging time and gave me a whole new appreciation for military families. And I'll say this, I mean, at, at the moment, I, I was a girlfriend. I was, I, we had talked about getting married before he deployed and we knew we were moving in that direction. And we thought well, maybe this would be a good thing to do. We'll get married and, um, it'll make things easier. That's kind of, you know, without talking, we talked about the specifics of why, but you know, um, and we decided against it. And I'll say this now that I'm a mom with kids, I have a totally different picture of deployment because being a single person with someone you love is difficult. Being a mom with a bunch of kids while your husband's away, is something else entirely and doing that multiple times year after year after year. So it really gave me an appreciation for military wives in general and uh, military spouses, which I don't think we really talk about enough. And we don't yeah. because no one knows what that's like in the news. So they have no idea. So it's yeah. almost, it's not almost not intentional, but it's still an omission, a part of right. the story. Yeah. Yeah. Cause as a military spouse, you're keeping the home front completely running. You're in charge of right. the maintenance, you know, there may be financial support that comes in, you know, the che check from your, your spouse that's deployed, that's deposited to your account, but you're in charge of everything, making sure that the bills get paid, making sure all the activities at school, if they're in sports, the kids are there, if you're, you know, got parent teacher conferences, and yet many of the spouses are working as well, trying to manage all that. And yeah. then the re-entry when they come back home and yes. you're exhausted, you're done. Yes. You want to just go here, take all this. <laughs> right. And they just come back from deployment. <laughs> yeah. They've just come back from deployment. They, they just want to chill and relax and, you know, after what they've been doing. This happens to me every week now. I just want to be <laughs> clear about this. Leif travels all the time now. It's not the same. So I'm making a joke. But this happens. I, this is, I think, a whole part of the story people don't realize. And even, even this, um, the State of the Union, Debbie, I don't know if you saw the State of the Union address this year. There was, they, they put up a, a military family, a woman with her children, and her husband's deployed. 
and her, they surprise her yeah. with the husband. And all I could think, you know, everyone's clapping, like, this is an amazing moment. And my heart, I just like, you know, you just feel for her because I'm sure she's ecstatic that her husband is back. At the same time, she's like, what does the house look like? What's going yeah, on? Yeah. What if I get the kids to bed? How are we going to, is he here to stay? Like, is he leaving? What is he going? Like, it's a million different yes. things and it's not easy. And, you know, even if Leif goes for a couple of days away, you know, I have the kids on like a, a schedule. He comes back and he wants to like hang out with them. I'm like, are you kidding wait, me? Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. have to go to bed. Are you, you know, what's happening here? <laughs> but that, I mean, so that's a microcosm uh, yes. of what's going on and the, the disruption and it's disruption for everybody. And, you know, of course, when someone comes back from deployment, they want to relax and be at home and they don't want to be, I mean, so it's really this like tempo. And I, I, one, one wife described it to me that way of like rhythm, you know, and like you get your rhythm and then like you get thrown off of it. It's like, how quickly you can get back yeah. on something that's complimentary. You're never going to necessarily be on the same rhythm, but you got to compliment each other. Right. So, you know, and it's, it's hard. So yeah. I don't think there's any appreciation for that. It's like, yeah. it's like the fourth trimester in pregnancy is like coming back into pregnancy. <laughs> <laughs> the months after it still yeah. matter. Yes. Women will understand that. Sorry guys. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but that is, and you know, we talked about this a little bit um, on the call yesterday was the significance and the important of when we say thank you to our veterans who are serving that same sacrifice is the family sacrifice mm -hmm. and we need to make sure we say thank you to them because they wouldn't be able to do what they do on the combat you know on the fields of combat if it wasn't knowing that their home was solid and things were taken care of if there were issues at home and worries then it's a dangerous mission for them because they're not focused on what their mission needs to be over right. there. Right. And, you know, our military families deserve that gratitude as well. And thanks for what they do because it is a team that, you know, serves our country, not just the, the veteran themselves. So thank you, Jenna, for that. Well, I mean, th I mean, listen, I did a small part and I think that's what I, I spoke to a group of um, military spouses a couple of years ago. And I was, <laughs> first thing I said was, uh, I know all that I don't know, which is yeah. I got a taste of it, but I didn't, you know, I didn't have years of this. I didn't have decades of this. Yeah. And I said, really, the military spouses are the keepers of all the stories. You mm -hmm. know, they're the ones carrying all those stories, whatever they are, because they're, they're the depository of all of it, yes. you know, yeah. and, and so it's, good. It's really, it really bothers me like, deep, deeply. It's one of the reasons with Smarter News that we try to include military voices in the news. It, we don't show um, preferential treatment because that would be news, right? You know, you, you want to make sure you want to represent all the different voices. But so often the military voices are just excluded completely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that even if you introduce them, even if it's just a little bit of something from the military spouse or someone who's active duty, you're doing something amazing. Um, compared to what kind of happens in the press on a regular basis. And like I said, I don't necessarily think that's intentional all the time. I just think it's people just don't have any experience. So they're not drawing from that and they have no right. idea, you know. Right. right. So good. And, you know, you, you talked a little bit of that transition that takes pl place on a weekly basis in your home, you know, with life <laughs> traveling and coming back in and going back out. But I can only imagine that for you, one of the major things you've dealt with is that transition of, you know, you lived in New York, you were on Fox News National, uh, you went to Texas, talk about contrast between two places geographically even, but share a little bit about what that transition was like for you when you left New York and left Fox News? Well, that was a really, I mean, it was such a tumultuous time in so many different ways. And, you know, I had not planned to stop a career that I had worked so hard for. I mean, my entire life was geared towards journalism, being a journalist. And then I achieved this goal that I didn't really realize that I would be able to do, which would be you know, anchoring a national news show. So the idea that I would ever choose to walk away just never really dawned on me. And I really feel, I say, Debbie, that I feel like God knows I'm a journalist because he triple sources things for me because I doubt them over and over again. And then he's like, ah, and you're like, okay, like I got it. Like, <laughs> you know, so it was very clear to me that I didn't have a home 
um, that I could continue doing, doing the journalism that I wanted to do. And it was, you know, remember the time was 2017, it was right after the election. There was a lot of upheaval. And I mean, the news space in general was just, you know, um, I don't even know what the right word is. I'll let our letter participants use their own adjectives. So, you know, we had, um, we had a house that we could come to in Texas that we thought we were gonna rent out. We didn't own anything in New York. We didn't own that, we didn't have a piece of property to our name. We happened to have buy uh, a piece of property that we thought we were gonna rent out outside of Austin. And so we just came here. Like we didn't know that we were gonna come here. And so I went from America's largest city to being on the air every day um, for two hours a day to a 600 person town outside of Austin hmm. in the country. and you know, I thought it was tough. Like I thought I could do like, what's the big deal? Like I'm going to have time with my kids. My kids were two and one years old at the time. Leif's business was picking up, but it wasn't, it, it suddenly got very busy. So I was alone with the two-year-old and the one-year-old in the middle of the country, you know, 20 minutes from the grocery store on the highway. Like, and I hadn't, even, I didn't even know how to pack the car with the kids. You know what I mean? Like I didn't even know yeah. what to put in a car. I could pack a stroller, but I couldn't, I didn't even know what I needed. You know, I went to the grocery store and it was like the most overwhelming experience because it's, it just was so huge, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, and it sounds ridiculous. I mean, these are really first world problems to have, like packing a car and like going to the grocery store, but I didn't really know how to live that way at all. So the transition was just huge and uh, very depressing at times. I mean, and, and I, you know, Leif was super supportive. And I think at times it was like, are you upset? Cause you're not on, you're not on television. You're not doing your career. Are you upset? Like what's going on? You know, and no, what's, frankly, what's causing this so yeah, I can deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't even, I, I didn't even know um, because I was so hell bent on making it work, you know, and what I, what I realized is actually in the long run is that that wasn't the right place for us to live. We ended up moving. Um, but at the time we didn't know, you know, we didn't know if we were going to stay, we just didn't know anything. So it was a very, very tough transition and, uh, still is. I mean, I mean, I'm looking at, I'm like 2020. Okay. So it'll be three years in June. And I think I'm just sort of figuring out what this is like, you know, um, and that, that's, that's been hard that it's taken so long when I thought, oh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to cook. A couple and weeks and we'll be good. Yep. It's going to be great. I got like a towel closet. I've never had a towel closet before. I have a pantry. I've never had a pantry because I grew up in San Francisco where we also were in a, in a flat, in an apartment. Yeah. So I've never lived in a house, you know, and you're like, wait, what? I had no schedule. Uh, for 10 years, I'm mean, similar to people in uniform. It's not similar in, in the job, but for 10 years, I didn't have to worry about what I was wearing because all my clothes were in my office. Someone did your hair and makeup, which sounds great. It was great. <laughs> Miss that. Uh, no, but you know, those are certain routines that you're relying on to kind of give you an anchor in your life, you know, of like, oh, you're going to go into work, your clothes are there. I don't have to think about that. And then suddenly I was like, I don't even know who I am anymore, let yeah. alone how to parent or how to be a wife. It was, it was very, very disruptive. Yeah. And I, very th upsetting. I think that, you know, there's so many similarities, even though, like you said, not compared to what our men or, and women are dealing with when they're in combat being fired at, but just transition in itself is right. so similar. You know, they came geographically, they're in the combat zone, you know, they're in, if they're in Iraq, they're in hot places, bullets are zinging by their head, bombs are blowing up and they come home and nobody's, there's, there's no, danger you're not being but yet they're still apprehensive because that's where their mindset is so that's right. why we get the you know hyper vigilance and they're always walking and they hear a sound and they think it's it's that because the contrast is so different as it was for you when you went from new york to texas you know i remember i grew up in colorado the first time i went to new york and i saw you know we're walking downtown and it said 800 dollars a month i'm like oh that, that's not too bad for rent an apartment for 800 dollars a month and they said no, that's a place to park your car is $800 a month. <laughs> I'm like, my house payment is $877 a month. And that's, I said, you know, that's why most people don't have cars in the city. They right. use the transit that's there. They walk. 
So that's why for you, you didn't even know how to pack a car because you didn't very often drive anymore. Well, I, I think know if you had a car. It definitely gave me some appreciation for Leif because he, he came out of the military. Uh, he, I, we kind of did, did it all at one time. He left the military. We mo he moved to New York. He had never lived in a place like New York. And it was it was really, really a difficult transition and difficult for us as a couple, difficult for him. Um, and it gave me a, a whole new appreciation for that. And what, what you're talking about, I mean, it, it's hard for people to imagine this. And I certainly don't know what it's like to be on the front lines. But there's certainly some comfort in being in a certain state. You know, even if it's a heightened state of stress, I, I felt the most relaxed when I was covering breaking news and everything was burning down around me in the studio. I found it very that's what you knew. relaxing. Was, yeah, I was very clear. I could operate in a very clear way. Um, people would be screaming, like it would be the more chaotic, the more controlled I would be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was nothing that would replicate what, what, how is that ever going to be replicated in real life? It's not, that's not, doesn't get replicated, you know? And it, Leif actually said that to me once where I said, you know, I've ha I'm just having a hard time. Like I can't talk to anyone that understands kind of what, where I've been, what I've seen. And I, I want a little understanding. And he's like, where else are you going to find a news anchor like hanging out at the plate or like, what do you mean? You're not going to find that, you know, yeah, similar to yeah. where he wasn't going to find yes. that either. You know, how is he going to find like another guy? And like you can find some of that, but it's difficult. I'm mm -hmm. sure uh, as some of uh, our participants know, like it's very difficult. How do you relate? So um, again, it's not the same thing, but it's all about transition and kind of learning how to transition and what's the right you know, is there a right way to do it or a way that you can do it better and, and trying to find some sort of, I don't want to say peace in the process because it's not, it's actually totally crummy. <laughs> I think everybody needs to be more honest about that. It's actually really yes. hard, you know? Yes. Yeah. This transition is difficult. And yeah. what things did you find in that process have helped you the most, most to be able to transition? I think for me, it was, I didn't realize this probably until maybe the last six months. Uh, when I started writing down more about the experience and realizing how much I was resisting the, how difficult it was. Like, I didn't want to admit how difficult it was because then it would be failing in some way. And I, you know, here I felt like I'm educated, I'm equipped, I can do this. Like, what, why can't I figure out how to like meal plan? I, I can't, like, I'm just telling you right now, like, that's not, I'm not good at that. And I'm not good at going to the grocery store thinking ahead. Like, I never did that. And so kind of being more patient and showing myself more grace with that process would have made it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just was resisting so hard that I was making it miserable for myself. And quite frankly, probably miserable for life too. Um, because it was just, I couldn't figure it out, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing that really helped is, is trying to find one thing that anchors, um, anchors you throughout the day. So even during this time of pandemic, like the one thing that I've done, and I haven't done this by the way, in the last several months, I mean, clearly just had a baby, all these things. Like I would try to get a workout in here and there. Mm -hmm. I am religious about it right now. Like it is, I protect that time. It has to happen because if it's the one thing that I get done during the day and it creates a little space for everybody, then that's a good thing. So finding that, you know, if it wasn't that, if it was getting the laundry done, if it's one thing that you can do yeah. that makes you feel somewhat accomplished, then that helps kind of other things fall into place a little bit and prioritize. Yeah. And I think that's a great one, that physical exercise, because that's one of those ways that, you know, we can relieve that stress, you know, by working out hard, by doing something physical. We have endorphins that are released that are, you know, feel good endorphins when we're also getting our heart rate and doing that. So then that emotionally makes us feel better as well. And so that's, you know, one of the things I always tell people that's crucial in the midst of adversity and crisis is, you know, work out. Even, you know, the beginning of grief, I didn't feel like I wanted to get out of bed most days, right. but I did. I didn't do what I felt like. I knew with my will and with my mindset, this is what I needed to do. I would feel better once I did it. I didn't feel like it now, but even if it meant just walk around my little block, which wasn't much of a block there, where I live now, it's a pretty good sized block. So that would, you know, be a little better. But I tell people, if you got stairs, do an extra flight of stairs, start there, start with something, you know, trying to eat healthy, make sure that, you know, you're doing, try to stay away from that junk food, you know, that's not 
nutritious and <laughs> healthy for us. Try to do, you know, a high protein, you know, low carb diet. I'm a comfort food eater. So that's yeah, one of the things that, that I really, you know, had to struggle with and really have to, you know, work hard on that to stay away from that stuff. The exercise, you know, my challenge has been through this process for people to be reading their Bible five minutes a day, just five minutes a day. You know, even if you're, you know, not a Christian or not a believer, it's an amazing book and you will learn so much from getting into that and reading that, you know, and then, you know, and Debbie on that, I was thinking about that because we were talking, there is a story that I go back to all the time for this particular period. Uh, and I'm not, let me just be clear, something, I'm going to tell you guys everything that I'm not good at <laughs> in this whole, but one of the things is, is reading the Bible. I don't, I come from a Catholic background. We didn't read the Bible that much in my household. We went to church, we didn't read the Bible. I know it's crazy. So, um, but the story of Esther, you know, and I keep thinking about that during this pandemic of like, you know, why are we all here during this time? Like, what is this about? You know, maybe we are all created for a time like this. When you think about the people that have gone to war and then now we're going through this. I mean, I look at life, I'm like, geez, we can't even take a, get a break here, can we? You know, like <laughs> terrorism, pandemic. I mean, come on, if there's locusts, I mean, it's just, it's like too much. But I keep on coming back to this word of renaissance in my head. And I really do believe that's what's coming is that the people that are able to experience these challenges for this country are going to be the ones to lead it into the next renaissance. And this is the, this is the fuel, you know, like this is what's, this is what's churning and it doesn't mean it's not going to be devastating or depressing because it is. Yeah. Um, and and so you know, as we go through the different trials and tragedies or adversity, you know, those are the proving grounds that build that character and perseverance and strength into us for that next battle that we may face you right. know, for our military. Um, you know, they're trained to go to battle. They're trained in warfare, but it's a training process and they go through it over and they practice it over and over and over. They don't start out those strong warriors, you know, they don't start out hitting the target on, you know, the first time they've ever fired a gun. It's a practice. And I think life hands that to us as we go through those different things so that we can st stand stronger, so that we can lead, you know, um, the, the name of the podcast on me. That's probably Mark's final words to his teammates is they, he got ready to go up the steps that final time. And he said, on me. And he's saying, you know, I've got, you know, I see something, there's something different there. You guys follow me. I'm going to take the lead, follow me. And um, it was because of what he'd gone through. You know, he was a believer. He knew that if something happened to him, he would be in heaven the moment that he left here. And he didn't weigh the pros and cons and say, is this, should, is this good? Is this, well, what should I do? He just knew it was the right thing to do as he stood out there in that line of fire. And, um, you know, there were gifts that were left for others because Mark made that choice. But it was the proving ground, the testing, the trials that he'd gone through growing up, you know, the tragedies there that prepared him for that battle to be able to stand. So as we go through the pandemic, as we go through the COVID-19, if we make those choices to continue to stay in the fight and not give up and curl in a ball and feel sorry for ourselves, yes, it's difficult, but we've got to keep that fight. And it's not with our feelings, it's with our will, with our mindset that we can choose to do that. And uh, we hope that this has, you know, been encouragement to our listeners. And as we said, on me, follow us, we're going to give you some examples. We're going to bring great guests on that can share their experiences in life and, you know, what they've gone through and had to endure and how they overcame. And um, we so appreciate, Jenna, you being here and sharing your time and um, sharing a little bit of your, your heart and your soul with us. But one of the things we'd like to do for our guests, you've donated your time and we appreciate that so much for doing that, but we'd like to support you. What are some things that you're involved? How can we follow you? Are there other charities or foundations that you support that we can get behind? Well, um, for, for sure. I mean, I, I appreciate all of that. Um, uh, there's so many, there's so many great charities. I know you're going to be speaking with Travis Mill. Did you already speak with Travis? We spoke Mill? with Travis. Oh he was gosh. on Sunday. Yes. <laughs> Best guy ever. I love yes. Travis. Uh, and uh, Travis Mills is great. The Travis Mannion Foundation is great. Obviously these are all very complimentary, different things uh, from America's by warriors. But I started something called uh, Smarter News, which is just delivering quick, concise, nonpartisan news. And I did it thinking of the woman that, for example, like the military wife, 
a, a busy American mom? Like, how can I get her really solid information while she's on the go? And that's how it started. And the truth is, it's evolved very much. And uh, it turns out if you build something for women, guys like it too. <laughs> so it's not just for women. It's not news geared for women. If you could think right. about me as the her in smarter news. And so that's what I'm working on. That's what I built. I eventually kind of got led to that after, after leaving the traditional broadcast medium. So check that out. Let me know what you think. I always appreciate feedback. You know, it's still, it's still in the early stages. I've been doing it for now two years. It's evolved. It's been a, it's been a a challenge, but it's, it's also been exciting. So. Right. And that's smarternews.com spelled S M A R T E R H E R smart her news. Right. Yes. Oh yes, I left the edge out, and I knew that I was going to spell spell her after the smarter. I'm like, <laughs> okay, Jenna, you tell it. So <laughs> remind them again, so you've got it correct. No, smarter news. Um, smart S M A R T H E R N E W S uh, dot com. And I'm seeing a message, Jenna. Please comment about Kelsey as another strong military wife. Also, please talk about how she did that. Oh, um, just really quick, Debbie. I just wanted to try. That's something that. Travis Mills, talk about a, a fate move. I just happened to see that he was injured in Afghanistan and he did the first interview six weeks after he was injured with me on Fox News. And that's how we became really good friends over the years. I've interviewed him many times. So anyways, if people haven't seen Travis, then they need to, Travis Mills is someone you gotta see for sure. Yes, yes. And um, I'm trying to, we had two days that Facebook Live didn't work. What? I think he, we got his though. I think if you go to our America's Mighty Warriors Facebook page that he should be on there. Okay. If not, we are working, um, Zoom recorded all of them. So once we get someone to help us edit them, splice off the long you know, delay in the beginning, because it starts recording as soon as we get on to check to see if you know our sound and video is working. Um, but yes, Travis, I love him to pieces. Um, I've known him probably for about eight years when he kicked off the documentary there in Dallas. I was his um, honorary co-chair for that. Oh, nice. And just his humor, his zest for life, his never quit attitude, you know, it's just an amazing, phenomenal story. And his wife, Kelsey, that she has just, you know, stayed be- beside him when he said, take everything and go, you know, you don't want to stick around with me. Look what I'm, I'm not. And much. now I'm telling Kelsey all the time, take everything and go, girl. Like, <laughs> just go. Have fun. It's a weekend away, not permanently, just a little time. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and one of the things that we love in the military is a good challenge. So what challenge do you have to throw out to everybody? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I, I'll reflect on one, one story. I, one of my favorite stories we reported on Smarter News is a new study that is not new anymore. It was said new at the, at the time. They finally studied the impact of nature on people. Like if you, you know, instead of giving someone a pharmaceutical, like what could you actually do for them? And they had a small group of people go outside for different periods of time. And what they found out is that if you went outside for 15 minutes, uh, it, you didn't get more extra credit if you lasted longer. I mean, it was good, <laughs> but you didn't get more. If you just did 15 minutes, if you sat outside, you could not be on your phone. You could not read. You could not work out, which I thought was hard. Uh, you know, you could sit there with a cup of coffee. You could, you could do that, but mm-hmm. you were supposed to just sit <laughs> in nature from 10 to 15 minutes that the amount of effect on like the cortisol in your brain was significant. And so they started calling this the nature pill. And thinking about how doctors can prescribe that to people as a real solution other than medication. And so I really thought about that a lot since I did that story. And I think it's a good thing. I know not everyone can get outside right now, but if you can, and it's hard to do it without your phone, I mean, it's really hard, but you'll be amazed as how quickly 10 to 15 minutes go by. And, you know, even if you just let your mind wander, I think it's a good, it's a good thing to try. It's been hard for me to do, but the times that I can do it, I really think it it helps a lot. It really does. And one of the things that, sorry, Jenna, one of the things that we do um, in our Helping Heroes Heal program is the hormone and vitamin therapy. And the stress depletes um, our vitamin D. It affects the cortisol, as you said. And so that's one of the things that's so important, as you said, to get out there for 15 minutes um, I love that it's not doing anything else. It's not like, oh, I'll just take my work outside and I'll still, oh my gosh, I got this no book. online I'm shopping. Out. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. So that's awesome. That's it. okay, folks. Yeah. So just 15 it. minutes a day from Jenna, we, you need to get outside, no phone, no books, just relax. That that's is there. so crucial. Probably so 
so important. Well, thank you, Jenna. I know one of the things we follow up, I, I, we went a, a little bit longer today, but I know that um, our friends that are in the chat room probably have some questions for you. You got time to stick around for a few Q&A? Sure, yeah, of course. And Ryan's gonna come on Jenna, board. What's happening? Hey, what's happening? Thank you for uh, joining us today. You, uh, you are our missing link. Uh, Debbie and I have been talking uh, since we got this started about the importance of spouses and you nailed it. Um, confirmation, affirmation, whatever you want to call it, Jenna, I believe God's had his hand over this entire process of On Me 20. Uh, you got a response on Facebook Live. I don't know if you're watching from a Miss uh, Haley Davis. It says, thank you for your time, ladies. I'm a British spouse now living in the States and I've had my own challenges with life changes in general, let alone getting used to new things and now associated with the military. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. um, you, you had a, you know, that, that's what this is all about. And, you know, you're sharing today and your authenticity and vulnerability is amazing. And so thank you. Uh, I'm sure my wife was upstairs listening and probably nodding her head, you yeah. know, the whole time she's <laughs> sending me these Facebook things and I'm sure she's nodding her head with all these challenges and kid, kid fun times. We have two little ones too. So um, yeah. anyways, but thank you for, for joining us. Um, and thank you for your share. Um, so let me get to a first question. This one's a little bit long, so I'm going to try and shorten it down a little bit. Um, but any, you know, thoughts around, um, it says here, describing the warriors coming home and bringing the war home. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes uh, we get really, um, not myself, but military, similar to athletes, which I was, we still stay very connected to the group that we were with and, and around a lot. And so it says, um, they also describe the challenges of observing the intimate bonds that their partners have with their team while they share more with the team than they do with you. Mm. Um, so any, any comments or thoughts around that? Yeah, this is interesting. I mean, this is something that um, I've seen myself and I can see it in, in other family dynamics too. I think and, and, and I'm going to use a journalist kind of um, I'm approach it that way everyone has their, their own story that they're living out. And what's very difficult about being a spouse is that oftentimes you, um, and I say this with love because I do it, <laughs> um, you're inserting yourself into the story in a way that maybe you, you weren't there. So for example, my husband has stories and comes back, tells me different stories about what happened. Um, I might hear those stories from other people, they're told in different ways. I get super defensive. Right. Because my husband told me the accurate story. Right. Not everybody. So, but I wasn't there. I have no idea what actually happened over there. I just have the story. That's why I was saying a lot of military spouses were holding on to these storylines. That's what we have. And we're not really a participant. It's, it's very difficult. And I think, I think sometimes um, I have to remind myself of that. It's like those stories actually belong to him. I know I'm part of it. I know I'm part of his collective story, but I don't own a part of that story. I don't need to insert myself in there. And there are certain things that are storylines that are playing out without me. And um, I had to be secure in myself mm -hmm. to just let that ride because I wasn't there to begin with. And I wasn't there in the middle. I'm here at, I'm at a certain point. And so you got to respect, it's almost like when a journalist, it's one of the things that I, I feel is missing sometimes from journalism is a respect for the story where the journalist doesn't have to insert themselves in there. You have to think about that way a little bit as a spouse. I think military or not, there are certain things that um, are sacred to your spouse that you, you just may not be a part of the way that you want to be. And that's your challenge, you know, and that's, it's very difficult. So it's, I'm not saying that uh, without um, like, oh, it's no big deal. No, it's very hard. And, and understanding that together and having respect that you both have storylines that involve each other, but maybe not in a central role is like one of the keys to marriage, I think. And we're, uh, listen, we're still learning that. So it's not like I have the secret to uh, everything. <laughs> Uh, we're not perfect, but we're progressing, right? Yes, that's right. It's not about perfection. It's about potential. That's right. what I say. Yes. I like that. I like that. There are, there are a lot of similarities. So when Debbie and I got connected, my, my experience is in the athlete space. And so I know my wife feels the same way, right? When I get around a group of guys, especially like any sort of reunions, just like the military, you know, you get in that family and it's, it's that story, like you said, 
that you're distant from, but we're so connected to. So um, I can really, I can really appreciate that perspective. And thank you for that share. That's, that's Absolutely. outstanding. Um, so happy military spouses day, Jenna, do you have any, I'm not going to call them regrets. I'm going to say, do you have any uh, thoughts or wishes that you may have done things differently in transition from Fox? Um, oh. So, uh, huh. and, and have you stayed in contact with any of your former, um, colleagues you know, that's been a really interesting I mean regrets that's such a big word yeah. I don't know I mean um I don't know if I, I I you know I actually don't think I have enough distance to really know I think I'm just getting enough distance to be like well did I do that right did I do you know should I have transitioned differently I you know I don't know I really don't know the answer to that um I think one of the most surprising things is and people may not know this, like when I went into work, I went into an office, I prepared for my interviews. I talked to my producers who were sitting on a different floor and then we'd go into the studio. I desperately miss our crew. The crew would be the one people that I would talk to all the time. Audio guys, cameramen, camera women, stage manager, those makeup, hair, you know, that part of the crew. But to be honest with you, most of the time I was very lonely. Um, I didn't talk to a lot of our colleagues. Everyone's busy. Everyone's doing their own thing. And, um, you know, I had young children. So there was a part of it that was very lonely. I thought that I um, would maintain more of the relationships. And I think that's been one of the hard things is uh, out of sight, out of mind, you know, is, is, is real. <laughs> and it's been hard to maintain some of those relationships in New York and also be very confronted with, oh, maybe they didn't, the other party didn't feel that they needed to maintain that. You know, I, I get very attached to people, even if I wasn't around them all the time. I, I miss my crew. I miss the, the folks that I worked with every day. And, um, Sometimes it's like, wow, look at all the time I spent there and how hard I worked. And do I even have anything more to say about it? You know, uh, and that's been, that's been, you know, did my work matter? I think I come back to, and there are moments where I feel like it did. I know I did during some big news stories. I knew I delivered well professionally, you know, personally, I probably could have used some work that I uh, develops more in-depth friendships, but I've kind of been a little bit of a loner like that for most of my life. So maybe that's not necessarily that's, and I know that sounds weird because I was on television <laughs> in front of millions of people, but you can actually be an introvert and do that. So yeah, it was, it, so I don't know. It's hard. I didn't really answer that question very well, but um, that's right. I see Carrie. Thank you very much. She stepped off the train and it kept rolling. Exactly. Yes, that's true. <laughs> but you know, I knew I wasn't supposed to be on it. You know, I knew I had to get off of it. So we'll see. We'll see how the cookie crumbles over the next few years to see if I really regret it. Right now, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. And you know, that, that's a perfect analogy for right now as people are um, in the midst of the transition, looking at things and they're not going into the office, you know, if they're, not if they're out of the military now and they've got another job and they're not going to the office or we're doing everything differently. And some people have maybe had that time to step back and go, is this what I should still be doing? Right. You no. Know? And yeah. I think this is a great time for us to take that and reevaluate where we're at. Do well, we get, want to do something different? And let me just Are mention this. Stuck? I will mention this. You know, a lot of my, I thought I would have more support from some of my colleagues. I did. I thought, you know, like it's no big deal. What's a big deal to support someone on social media or whatever. And I think everyone was like, what is she doing? She's broadcasting with no makeup on in her kitchen, giving a news update. And I'll just point out, Debbie, that everyone is doing that now. <laughs> yes, you, you, you were so a trailblazer see, there. I mean, it was they, just, it was just like good, when you know. Leif came on, <laughs> when Leif came on though, and in the midst of this, everybody's trying to, you know, figure out like me, I've never been on Zoom. So you figure out Zoom, you're adapting, you're, you know, trying to focus on work and the call you got, the kid comes running in or you hear something knocking on the, you know, and Leif had to get up, I think three times Liberty right, yes. came through the door. And yet for everybody else, they're like, oh my gosh, this is reality. This is yeah. what I'm dealing with. So I'm not alone. So I think it, it's, it's real, you know, yeah. it's not fake, it's real. And so I think that's, that's important in our lives to have that. So well, kudos to you, girl. Do I, I think, so I don't know. <laughs> like, like you said, you know, sometimes you're like, well, I don't really know what the reflection will be eventually. Right now, it's kind of like the jury's out. 
So, and it's, it's hard to be comfortable with that because you'd love to say, I have no regrets. I am like, I am flying. I'm like, actually, this has been really difficult. Yeah. I don't know, you know, um, right. but I don't, I, I knew, I knew that I couldn't stay. So yeah. you have a moment in your life where you're like, this is either I can look myself in the mirror or I can't, and you have to make a decision. And, you know, I know that I made the right one. So at least that, I think it would be difficult. I, I wasn't confident about that, but I am. Yeah. Yeah, so good. And Ryan, I want to thank you and your wife, Laura, too. I know she watches the Facebook and makes, you know, she replies does. to people there yes. and gets the comments and questions and prayer requests out of there. So, uh, Laura, I know we can't see you right now, but we appreciate that. And, and Ryan, um, you know, that this came together because God brought the two of us together. And we have no idea. We just were obedient. We have no idea what the outcome. I know that we've gotten tons of response from people who saying, I just, this is what I needed to hear today. This is what I needed. Thank mm -hmm. you so much, you know? So and good. so um, thank you, Jenna, for being part of coming on and inspiring people and encouraging people. And, um, you know, I'm blessed to have you in my life. I, you know, tell people all the time, Mark's final gift to me was his teammates that I call my boys, but I've got a lot of awesome girls that came with those. Well. Guys, so. <laughs> thank you, Debbie. Yes, yep. you bet, you bet. If you were struggling, please do not hesitate to reach out. We have therapies that can heal your brain, that can help you with your PTS and your TBI. Uh, we care, you are not alone. Uh, please, that is not a sign of weakness. Please reach out. Uh, you can reach us through our website, americasmightywarriors.org, or our email address is just americasmightywarriors at gmail.com. Uh, we are here to help you. It, there is hope, it does not have to end that way. And there are things that we can do to support you. So please, please, please do not hesitate to reach out. If you know a veteran that's struggling with suicide, please reach out on their behalf as well. And Jenna, again, thank you so much. God bless you. Give the kids all hugs for me and give life one too. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. And everybody, me. we'll see you back tomorrow for On Me 20 podcast number 16. We're almost down with 20 consecutive ones. So Thank you all for your support. We hope you've been blessed today and we hope you say on me, follow me. I'm going to take the lead, lead myself, lead my family, lead at work, lead at church, wherever it is. Um, thank you. God bless you. Have a great day. When fear flashes its teeth like a lion. When evil roars and walls begin to shake There's a strength that's not my own There's a fire in my bones He is with me and his hand is ever on me Follow on me We're marching out into the night Follow on me We're standing up against the giant Follow on me We might be walking in the fire But if it's where we're meant to be Then on me